Latin America and the Caribbean, a popular resistance broadcast of hot news out of the region. In partnership with Black Alliance for Peace Haiti America's team, Code Pink, Common Frontiers, Council on Hemispheric Affairs, Friends of Latin America, Interreligious Task Force on Central America, Massachusetts Peace Action, and Task Force on the Americas, we broadcast Thursdays at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, right here on YouTube Live, including channels for The Convo Couch, Popular Resistance, and Code Pink. Post-broadcast recordings can be found at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Telegram, radindymedia.com, and now under podcasts at popularresistance.org. Today's episode, Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov visits Brazil. I'm really happy to welcome back to our program my friend, activist, journalist, and editor with Casa Chu News, uh, Camila Escalante. Welcome, Camila. Really, really happy that you could join us today. Oh, thank you for having me again. And um, I'm really glad that you're as enthusiastic and excited about, you know, everything that's going on in Latin America right now, and specifically Brazil. Well, let's um, let me give our audience a little bit of background about what we're going to talk about today, because I think you and I both agree that this visit um, from the Russian foreign minister to to Brazil and and Venezuela, Cuba and Nicaragua as well is really uh, pretty significant. It's a big it's a big message to the hemisphere and, and the global south. So let uh, let's give the audience a little bit of background. Uh, Russia's foreign minister, uh, Sergei Lavrov, arrived in Brasilia on Monday for talks with his Brazilian counterpart, Mauro Vieira, in the latest of a series of bilateral encounters, which are ruffling the United States. And we'll talk about some of those comments coming out of Washington, D.C. Lavrov arrived just as Brazil's president, Lula da Silva, returned from a state visit to China. And both missions are part of a diplomatic reset Lula has pursued since returning to power this year, as he strives to recover Brazil's international reputation after his predecessor, Jair Bolsonaro, dismantled Brazil's established tradition of cooperation. For Brazil, that means rebuilding and maintaining ties with all partners, regardless of geopolitical tensions elsewhere. Lavrov and Vieira said that their talks had also focused on energy and trade. About a quarter of agricultural powerhouses Brazil's fertilizer imports come from Russia, while the two countries engaged in a record 9.8 billion U.S. in bilateral trade last year. Brazil was Lavrov's first start, excuse me, first stop on a week-long Latin America tour that will also include, as mentioned earlier, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba. So, Camilla, this is really um, pretty exciting and a huge message for the, I I would argue, for the rest of the world, not just the hemisphere, including the United States, but really a a, a big message as to um, what the what the Brazilian president sees for his country, the hemisphere and um, and the geopolitics in general. Yeah, precisely. I think that, you know, Lula and everyone that he has in his cabinet and around him and this government of Brazil really sees itself as a principled actor. It sees sees it really, um, you know, married to the Constitution and to, uh, you know, a certain style of foreign policy and diplomacy. Um, and it is going to take its own sort of um particular path with its own characteristics um, internationally. Obviously, and uh, Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister of Russia, said it himself. Um, He's made comments about how Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua are paving their own path, a very distinct path, a very independent uh, path for, for their people. He didn't put Brazil in that category And, you know, it's very obvious why Um, the Brazilian government is a much, you know, made up of a much wider coalition of different um, of different parties, different political ideologies and approaches. And so they're not quite ready to say in Brazil that this is some sort of revolutionary government, but it's a government that domestically is trying to provide a lot 
of uh, social programs, really trying to fix everything that's wrong with the country in order to make, you know, to to make a, a much better standard of living for the average Brazilian person. But then internationally, which is what everyone is, you know, so concerned about now in the, you know, in the in the press frenzy that we're seeing right now, I think that they are also taking their own unique position as far as Latin America goes. You could say that it's more aligned with the position of Bolivia, which Bolivia mm-hmm. says it's a neutral actor. It says, um, you know, it, it has kind of condemned uh, NATO in some ways, uh, but hasn't taken any too, you know, strong of a stated position um, as the very close and good, reliable allies of Russia, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. But in Brazil's case, I think when it makes these small statements or these remarks that we've heard from Lula, from his foreign minister and from his presidential advisor, Celso Amorim, these statements say a lot to the world. It's very difficult for them to make bold statements about what's going on in the proxy war in Ukraine without getting you know, hit by this giant storm of, uh, of media slander, both internationally and from the Brazilian press. And so, you know, they've had to be very careful in the first three months of government with what they with what they've said and what their position has been. And so for a lot of people looking from the outside and even for a lot of Brazilians, I think it has been, you know, their position towards the conflict has seemed a little bit murky, a little bit unclear. And one of the reasons why it was unclear, of course, was because um, in the UN General Assembly, a vote was taken and it was an anti-Russian resolution that Brazil actually voted in favor for. They voted in favor for it, but they actually had a hand in modifying some of the text of that resolution because they said that it didn't uh, it didn't um, have enough, uh, leave enough space for dialogue um, and, and trying to to work with Russia, Brazil believes that um, you know this Russian special military operation in Ukraine um, is in violation of you know the territorial integrity of Ukraine, and so for that reason they have condemned it. Now at the same time, we have heard the statements from Lula saying that he believes that. Currently, the European Union is directly involved in the conflict and that the EU and the US um, are actually encouraging the war, incentivizing the war by sending arms to Ukraine. And for that reason, he says that we can no longer call the US and the EU neutral actors. They're, of course, not uh, actors who could be said to be not involved. And so this just qualifies them from joining any sort of, you know, process towards peace in terms of Brazil's uh, pro- proposal to bring people around to a table, uh, different countries that, you know, um, you know, countries that have the potential to mediate uh, the conflict. And so he has specifically said that he believes China is, of course, the most important actor right now that could help negotiate peace. And China has a a peace plan that Brazil supports. He also mentioned India and Indonesia as countries who want peace. And of course, Brazil as well. But he says that that, that simply, you know, given all of the, the way in which the United States and the EU only talk about war, they don't talk about peace, that that's just simply not their objective. So they can't be a part of this process. Then, as if, you know, if anyone were to think that these were kind of just offhand remarks that he that he, you know, perhaps would have to back down or backpedal on. We heard, you know, we heard other people around him double down on these, Um, you know, his foreign minister, Mauro Vieira, um, had extended meetings with Sergei Lavrov and they held that joint press conference and everybody saw how friendly the two ministers were. they held a press conference in which um, Foreign Minister Mauro Vieira said that he once again, he reiterated, as he said in previous occasions, that Brazil is against the unilateral coercive measures, the illegal sanctions against Russia, and that those don't help in any way to de-escalate the conflict. These are illegal sanctions that are being imposed by all NATO countries, but they're not being imposed by the countries of the global south, and that includes, of course, Latin America and the Caribbean. And most people 
uh, in Latin America absolutely disagree with the imposition of those illegal sanctions. Um, then Lavrov in that same press conference said uh, very explicitly that Brazil and Russia have the same approach to international issues taking place right now around the world. He also said that this government of Brazil currently um, has the same vision for uh, you know, different multilateral organizations and the way in which their country should be participating in those forums and those organizations. And further, he said, you know, he reiterated that uh, Russia is a proponent, a supporter, an endorser of Brazil's bid to get a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. And that's really important because yes. it makes very clear that it's not the United States, certainly not Europe or their allies, who wants to see Brazil take that permanent spot um, or become a permanent member and have you know veto power on the UN Security Council. It's actually Russia. And of course, China would also be supporting Brazil's bid. At a time like this, when we're in the middle of a conflict, uh, with this massive propaganda campaign against Russia um, and, you know, these accusations of Russia committing, you know, whatever people are saying about what's going on in Ukraine, saying that it's uh, that that Putin is committing war crimes and all sorts of things like that. You have Russia coming and saying, we want Brazil on the UN Security Council as a permanent member, as well as India, and we're going to support that. That means that they truly believe that Brazil is either a neutral actor or on their side. And I yeah. believe that um, a lot of people are starting to see that Brazil is possibly very firmly um, on the side of Russia. So that's really important. Before this trip, before we received uh, Sergei Lavrov here in Latin America uh, a few weeks ago, Lula's presidential advisor, Celso Amorim, who was his foreign minister during his previous governments, took a little secret trip, which came out in the press after, but they didn't want to announce it beforehand, to Moscow. And there he met with Sergei Lavrov um, and other officials, and he had his own personal meeting with Putin. I mean, that's really important. And this is something that the United States is paying very close attention to because Celso Amorim is not just, um, you know, some random low level diplomat mm -hmm. or anything like that. He's a special presidential envoy. Um, and this is the closest you can get to Lula. It's in some ways even more important than sending the foreign minister. And so he took that trip. Now we have Lavrov here. Uh, and then we also, you know, Lula received... A, an invitation from Putin to go visit, uh, to organize an official visit to Moscow as soon as he's able to. And uh, the response was that they're going to look at organizing that trip very soon. Also, Mauro Vieira, uh, the foreign minister, was invited by Lavrov to come to Moscow. So he's making all of these, all of these sort of exchanges are taking place. And at the same time, Zelensky has seen this and has actually, uh, you know, he, he lashed out saying that he doesn't agree with some of the statements that are being made by these different Brazilian officials and that, you know, Lula is mistaken. And he says that he, that Lula needs to go travel to Ukraine and see the situation for himself. And, you know, Lula has only connected with um, with Zelensky via Zoom, via, you know, video call. And so, you know, there's no indication that they're going to be planning that. Um, I think it really speaks for itself, you know, what's going on here in terms of the alignment. Brazil is certainly not, um, can't be said to be a, an ally of Zelensky, the way in which, for example, Gabriel Boric is, yeah. um, and the way in which, unfortunately, some of the leaders, uh, the prime ministers of the Caribbean are because they allowed him to speak and give a presentation at the CARICOM heads of, oh, uh, heads of state and government summit. And so, you know, that's certainly not the case with Brazil. It's becoming clearer and clearer. And, you know, I think it's also, uh, we also saw the way in which Brazil was received, to say the least, warmly by the Chinese during oh, this extended trip to China where hundreds of people were part of Lula's delegation. Um, I mean, we can come back to that and speak about that a little more, but it's very clear that these two countries, these two super important world powers, 
believe that Brazil is the most important actor in all of the Western Hemisphere to ally with them. It is obviously, you know, the largest economy um, in the global south of the Western Hemisphere. And, uh, you know, they just, there's this whole general feeling that Brazil is back in terms of diplomacy, in terms of taking leadership in the world. So, you know, things are getting really exciting. Dilma Rousseff, you know, yeah. took the leadership of the New Development Bank uh, there in Shanghai last week, officially. And they're talking about all, doing all sorts of things with the New Development Bank, the BRICS Bank. They want to help finance these other emerging countries, not just the BRIC countries, but smaller countries that don't have access to financing to be able to, uh, you know, focus efforts on really key infrastructure projects in their different countries. One of those countries could be Nicaragua. And both Lula and Dilma had said in their remarks that they think that that's what the bank should be dedicated to, is helping these different countries without uh, getting these countries into suffocating debt, the way in which Argentina was plunged into suffocating debt and it's still suffering from now because of the IMF loan. They said, we don't need that sort of a bank or financial institution. We want to help, uh, you know, emerging economies around the world and the peoples. And so this is, you know, things are going to start changing quite a bit. And with that, you know, we're going to see all sorts of attempts to to sabotage, of course, uh, this Brazilian government because it's not doing what it's being told to do from Washington. I think it's, um, it's really, really fascinating to watch all of this unfold. And I think it's, to me, from the outside looking in, it's really, really important, as you mentioned, this, this temperament coming from, from Lula, that, you know, on one hand, we're recognizing, you know, we're calling Russia for invading Ukraine, but also it's like, hey, we don't want to see it escalate. We see who's fueling, you know, putting gasoline on the fire, Europe and NATO and the and the United States, and no weapons. We're not going to escalate any of that. So, it, I mean, it's a really, um, it's a it's a really important, in my opinion, a really important balance that he's striking. And of course, I would say, given um, you know, the Dilma now at the at the bank, the new bank, and as you mentioned, focusing on loans investment in emerging economies, Brazil's really focused on main on striking a balance to maintain global peace so that everyone can develop, particularly those countries that have never had the opportunity to do that, or for at least in the last 500 years have not had the opportunity to do that. It's a really, it's, it's, it's super, super important. I, it's, it's so profound and it's such an, it's, it's very simple actually in what he's trying to strive. It's not going to be easy to do it. But it's it's very it's like we need global peace for everyone, and it just so happens you know our major trading partner is China. And but but I don't think Lula is interested in excluding the United States. It's just that the relationship with the United States and Latin America and the Caribbean has to change, and that's the piece that you know a lot of us aren't particularly hopeful about. And again, I keep going back to this analogy in the audience who know this as well, and particularly coming out of the uh, September 2021 SELAC summit here in Mexico City, where, you know, the vision, AMLO's vision was we the uniting all of the Americas at a round table where everyone is an equal versus the current structure that's a rectangular t- table with the United States at the head and calling all the shots. So I don't, some of these countries are, would move on without the United States, but I think like in the case of Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, there is an attempt perhaps to, to stay allied to a degree with the US, but the relationship has to change and how possible that is, you know, Right. Well, one of the interviews that was given by Celso Amorim to the Global Times 
was he was saying that, you know, the visit that Lula made to Washington, uh, which was his third, his third uh, foreign visit outside of the country since he took office, the first, of mm -hmm. course, being Argentina, he met with Alberto Fernandez, and uh, participated in that SELAC meeting. Then he went to Uruguay, and then he went to the US. Um, it was very short. And he didn't get this massive state welcome. I mean, you can tell that the United States obviously wanted to start off on the right foot with this new Brazilian administration, but it was nothing special. In fact, most of the trip that Lula made was meeting with uh, U.S. labor, meeting with Democratic uh, Congress uh, lawmakers, but not um, necessarily the most important ones, let's say, some of the ones that the Brazilian government sees as being more progressive, uh, but not that's not really the government itself. Those are just Democrats. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, his agenda was a little bit, and obviously always meeting with, uh, you know, some Brazilians abroad uh, there in the U.S., but it was nothing like what we saw. They didn't make any agreements uh, or anything large. There weren't any huge announcements, and Celso Amorim says that was just a, you know, it was like a, a political trip, and didn't really have like a lot of dimensions to it. This trip to or to China that Lula made first to Shanghai, obviously to the New Development Bank, um, and he did other things as well. He uh, visited the Huawei headquarters. He got a whole tour, um, all sorts of other, um, all sorts of other tours and meetings. He met with the head of the Congress, uh, and he met with Xi Jinping in Beijing. And I mean, this was just a, a really incredible trip overall, um, lasting several days. When he was supposed to go, but fell ill at the end of March, there were already several people or a large number of people already in China at the time that he had to postpone because of illness. And they went ahead with their agenda and they came back with a lot of really important agreements. Uh, the Apex Brazil, which is a uh, an agency um, of the state for trade and investment, they held an entire uh, conference there with uh, a, a large number of Brazilian business people and Chinese business people. And they went ahead and signed away their agreements. And so by the time this was rescheduled for Lula to take the trip, it, it, we're talking hundreds of people uh, from senators to state governors to ministers uh, as well as, uh, you know, business people went to China to try to bring back the best possible deals for the country because, you know, they consider the Brazilian government the, the that the economy was uh, just left to its own devices, that uh, some of the investment, uh, foreign investment left the country during Bolsonaro years, those four years, and that it actually de-industrialized to an extent. Um, among many other problems, obviously the environmental degradation in the Amazon, all of the like illegal activity, uh, the illegal mining and the violence, uh, obviously was able to increase during that period. And they're having to crack down now. Um, you know, so so we're in a period of recovery in Brazil. And so they believe that China is one of the most important, if not the most important partner for Brazil right now in trying uh, to uh, to boost its economy, to bring back investment, um, and very importantly, uh, to help, you know, in the auto sector, um, but also fulfill some, you know, climate commitments and things like that. So a range of things came out of that China meeting. And I think it should be very clear to everyone that this is a country that's aligned with China and Russia. Um, so far, we, we've yet to see other trips, but we're still in the first 100 days right now um, of government. So um, going back to, you know, what the... Um, you know, what, what the Brazilian government has said about, about um, what they want to see in terms of the conflict, you know, it is really simple. They've said, we just, Brazil wants to promote peace. It's ready to discuss with a group of countries uh, to bring a group of countries together that are willing to talk about peace. This is like essentially the conversation that they've had with, with Xi and with the Russian authorities so far. 
Um, it's nothing specific. They don't have their own peace plan. And what what Lula said when, you know, in, in his remarks, when he basically said that the U.S. and the EU are not, um, you know, they're not exactly helping to de-escalate the conflict was very basic. He really just said that Olaf Scholz came to Brazil. He made that trip. It's one of the most important uh, foreign dignitaries that have arrived in Brazil since Lula uh, uh, was sworn in. And he asked to buy missiles. We have on the one hand, the Southcom uh, commander, General Laura Richardson, coming to Latin America, going around to different countries, um, asking to take uh, the the military equipment that exists in the country to send it to Ukraine and saying they're going to replenish it with U.S. military equipment. This is the Russian equipment that many exactly. nations have bought. Yeah, <laughs> they want to take the Russian equipment and then replace it with like with this yeah. U.S. equipment. They're literally begging for this. And then you have Olaf Scholz, uh, the German chancellor, coming to South America as well. And speaking to uh, the, these different presidents, also asking uh, to buy weapons to to send to Ukraine, uh, either to be donated or or just to buy them and, and and transport them there. Obviously, all of the countries declined, but at the time, you know, Lula didn't say a whole lot about it. He was just like, "This is an important uh, important visit from Schultz." Now he's saying he came to buy missiles. And that, that's precisely what they're coming for. It's not for diplomacy. It's not really for strengthening, uh, you know, trade or economic relations. It's because they're trying to continue fueling the war. At the, at the same time, you know, the U.S. and Europe and all of their major media is telling, you know, telling the citizens of, of these different of our countries of the north that that Ukraine is winning the war, that they're trying to bleed Russia out. Um, you know, drain them all of their resources and capacity to keep fighting. I mean, if they're doing so well, and they've been doing so well, supposedly for the last year, why do they have this campaign of begging around our region? It's truly, it's truly uh, bizarre. And so I think it's just becoming undeniable to the point where, you know, Celso Amorim and uh, Mauro Vieira and Lula have to say something about it. And so, they, I mean, their remarks have not been anti-U.S. This is no, how it's they going to be framed. It's going to be they framed in the media been. now is that Brazil has turned on the U.S., but they're not even anti-U.S. remarks. They're simply stating the obvious. So yeah. John Kobe, the uh, national security, um, or the, what is it, national security advisor. Advisor. Mm-hmm. Um, spokesperson, is it? Well, Anyways, he John Kirby, yes. uh, he made these remarks very promptly after he heard the comments of the Brazilian authorities saying that they were uh, just regurgitating Russian and Chinese propaganda. But they said very little. I mean, v- very little was said. So, you know, then after that, we saw the White House spokesperson, uh, Kareem, say that uh, that they don't agree with this and they don't like the tone of the remarks by the Brazilian officials. Um, so it's very clear that um, that they're watching very closely what the Brazilian government is doing. For them to be issuing these responses so quickly, it means that they are following everything that's happening with Brazil. Normally, you would get a response, um, you know, some sort of communication from the U.S. Embassy in Brasilia. In this case, the White House is reacting instantly to it. Um, and so and the mainstream media, there was I'm not sure if I saw this on your Twitter feed, a headline from yesterday, Lula cozies up to America's enemies. I mean, that's not subtle. <laughs> that's like, I, it's really clear what the narrative that Washington wants to create and or the the fear that they have. It's like, let me ask you this with Russia, Brazil, and China, there's clearly a trade relationship there. Russia, Brazil, Brazil to China, which basically covers um, Eastern Europe, what's becoming more and more Eurasia, but Russia to the hemisphere of the Americas, and then across the Pacific uh, to Asia, to China. I mean, that to me is a really not just the trade that involves the three countries because it's it's um 
a symbiotic trade relationship that all three of them are involved in, but it's pulling in three distinct parts of the world, which is, which is huge. And then you have the new development bank as well. And then you also have Brazil and China um, agreeing to um, respect their national currencies in their trade, which Marco Rubio went ballistic about uh, the other day. But um, I mean, yeah, he actually said that the U.S. isn't going to have the ability to to use sanctions anymore because the U.S. dollar is not going to be the predominant or the single uh, global currency. I mean, that was pretty. <laughs> I mean, we've all known that, but it was pretty amazing to hear that come from the United States so overtly. But there is. I mean, don't you think there? I mean, or, or I've asked you if I'm am I am I incorrect or correct in seeing that i'm using my hands here to point out the, the flow to the audience but you have russia and then across the atlantic to brazil and then and then across the pacific to china that's a that's a huge trade route between three you know really large co countries economically and population wise and land mass wise yeah and there, so that's that's one factor is the trade factor but um brazil has other interests in common with these countries, other ways in which they can cooperate. And it's really, uh, it'll be really interesting to see what happens. You know, it's very obvious and open that Russia has uh, sold weapons and, and provided uh, sort of uh, defense assistance to Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. And that's precisely something that they're always going to be discussing during these visits. And certainly the visit that Russia, uh, Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, is on now to these countries. But also, um, you know, I interviewed just a few weeks ago a leader of one of the urban housing movements um, in Brazil. Um, well, the person I interviewed is um, Gabriel Arujo. He is the leader of the MNLM, which is the National Movement for the Fight for Housing. Um, and it's a really, you know, important urban uh, housing movement, but they are also part of an anti-imperialist uh, committee that does a lot of really great solidarity with other countries. And they do so with the understanding that Brazil is a very important country for solidarity for um, going, kind of going off on a tangent here, but a very important country because they actually noted uh, with regards to Nicaragua that Nicaragua is signing all these deals for development uh, and infrastructure projects with China. And China's coming over with, you know, these construction companies and advisors, and they're going to help um, with housing and, uh, you know, roads and things like that. And he's actually saying we support China and we support China coming here with the BRI and everything else. But we think that this should be coming from Latin America, too. We think that with all of the construction uh, industry in Brazil, that actually Brazil could be providing the same sorts of support for small nations like Nicaragua, and we wouldn't need this other world power coming, you know, across across the world to to do all of that stuff. So they actually have a bit of a critical uh, position on that, saying, "Well, we think that China needs to have an important role here, and they're a very important ally to us economically and otherwise." Uh, why isn't Brazil filling that um, filling that position? But what he said regarding uh, Brazil's position. Um, so this is just to to share what the position is of the of some of the social movements, the anti imperialist perspective, which is not always the same as as the government. He said that it'd be very important for Brazil to strengthen relations with the Russian defense industry. Um, you know, that Brazil was once the fourth largest military industry in the world, and today its arms industry is deteriorating. Lula did visit a naval shipyard to talk about restarting uh, Brazil's nuclear submarine construction program in, uh, in partnership with France. But they're saying, you know, there's a lot more that Brazil should resume in defense in in uh, in, in the defense industry um, and other other partnerships with Russia. So, you know, if if 
Brazil were to go in that direction um, and have much closer cooperation in defense with uh, with Russia, it would be very interesting because then we're talking about a fourth country here. And you have to remember, like, this is Brazil and this current trip is being, um, you know, is being uh, categorized in the same group with longtime allies of uh, of Russia, Cuba, the Sandinistas and the Chavistas. Um, and so at the same time, people have no, might, might have noticed that the United States had increased military cooperation with Brazil under Bolsonaro. In yeah. fact, Trump offered uh, Brazil under Bolsonaro to become a, a major non-NATO ally, a special designation given by the United States to countries that are not part of the North Atlantic. They're not situated in the North Atlantic. And, uh, you know, Brazil's actually very far south. Um, and so, you know, they, they would be joining the ranks of Argentina and Colombia in that designation um, and receiving, you know, special military training and equipment and eligible for, for all sorts of help from the U.S. I mean, it's completely absurd. And the U.S. actually provides all of these things and more to countries, even without this special designation. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that because there's, you know, military bases in all sorts of countries and um, of Latin America and the Caribbean, such as Haiti. I mean, Haiti's not going to be considered a, a major non-NATO ally. Uh, and so, so all of these different um, joint military exercises have been going on in Brazil during this period. Uh, you know, organized between, you know, organized by Southcom or um, those are, those exercises are going on now or when Trump and Bolsonaro are under. They were they have been going on um, under Bolsonaro, but they're actually going to continue now because at the end of Bolsonaro's um, administration, he agreed to hold uh, this upcoming military exercise, which I believe is going to be in the fall. Uh, you know, between the two armies organized by Southcom. And I don't know in what way um, Lula has the ability to, you know, stop them uh, from taking place if it's something that the Brazilian government had previously agreed to. It seems like it's something that's just going to be carried out. And so just this week, uh, the the army South uh we're in we're in Sao Paulo uh, for a second planning meeting. The first planning meeting happened at the end in December when Bolsonaro was still in power. And so this is going to be another one. So that really makes things really prickly. Um, mm -hmm. It's very if you see what's wow. going on this week, uh, General Laura Richardson, the Southcom commander, uh, has made visits to so far Argentina and Chile to meet the, with uh, the defense ministers um, and also I think the police and you know all these other. Uh, talks. Um, and so it's very clear where, what their position is. Um, similarly, big protests in Argentina against her visit. It was kind of yeah, that was great. That, yeah. That's how it, it should be every time. Yeah. We see this in Panama, you know, yeah. the Panamanian movements and unions have been really good about protesting against the different visits from the U.S. government and military. Uh, but in most countries, these visits take place without a peep for most people. So it's yeah. very great to see that that happened in Buenos Aires. Um, I don't know if anything similar happened in Santiago and Chile, but uh, so their their position is very clear. We'll have to see in, in the coming months, you know, what happens in terms of Brazil allowing there to be a U.S. military presence in in the country, because there is a very large uh, presence and and there's you know there have been some revelations. I'm not sure who originally uh, broke the story, but that there were a large number of CIA agents in Brazil um, in in the last year, let's say. And wow. so I think it's going to be really interesting to see you know where things go from here in terms of the U.S. having a foothold in Brazil. Um, as politically um, and otherwise, Brazil is, you know, forging these ties with the other BRICS countries um, and trying to, you know, strengthen relations with other countries of Latin America um, and, and be sort of a, a, a global leader from our corner of the world. It's really, it's really, really exciting. And, you know, you mentioned um, these U.S. military assets in, in Brazil 
and the upcoming Southcom exercises. I think this is a really good example of how presidents inherit policy and it doesn't, you know, you don't just undo that, especially, you know, in, in the case of, of a constitutional change of government, electoral change of government versus, you know, a hot revolution. There's policies that you inherit and they're not necessarily undone, you know, in the first days of your administration or even in your first administration. And I think that and that, that that's true, and not just in Brazil, but all over the Americas right now, with all these new left of center presidents that we have, they can't necessarily undo everything uh, in your first administration. And in many cases, your own the Constitution only allows for one term, such as in Colombia, four years, and here in Mexico, six years. And you have to constantly be building for the future. And, you know, and, and we've talked about this on many episodes, you know, the importance of, of social movements, labor movements to build that ground movement to ensure, you know, uh, a, a, a new administration's project can continue. But this is a really good example with Lula that how do you just come in in 100 days and all of a sudden just say, OK, every U.S. asset out of the country. But it could also be a good reason to be more friendly with Russia, to keep a balance of power just inside your own country. Well, yeah, that's precisely what they seem to be doing, because at the same time, there was that little, you know, uh, scandal or um, controversial event when uh, the military of Brazil allowed the Iranian ships to dock at Rio Mm -hmm. de Janeiro. And so that was upsetting to a lot of uh, U.S. lawmakers, they made a lot of comments about it, uh, both online, uh, including, I think, Ted Cruz, um, but mm-hmm. also um, in different uh, interviews, um, noting that Brazil had this very friendly uh, disposition to Iran. But if you ask the Iranians and if you ask the Brazilian government, this is just a very normal, cordial relationship as they've always had. Uh, There's no reason for them to be hostile. And Brazil has said on numerous occasions that the legal sanctions, just like the ones imposed against Russia by these Western countries, are just as invalid when it comes to Iran. Iran is one of the most sanctioned countries in the world and has been for a while now. And and it Mm -hmm. makes it makes things extremely difficult um, in the country. But um, it could be said that Iran is one of the countries um, that is most sanctioned, but that is has able to mitigate a lot of the effects uh, of those sanctions. Um, But it it does obviously, you know, affect a country's ability to to develop. Um, But. So, you know, it, it seems that based on the comments that we heard from from the Brazilian government that they don't consider you know those they don't consider those valid so they're not you know they're they're not really concerned at this time about secondary sanctions and I think it was asked in a press conference um, at the State Department whether or not the Brazilian government would be subject to these uh, secondary sanctions and uh, I guess Ned Price I believe it was Ned Price on that day he said that you know at this time he didn't have an answer but that they consider their relationship with Brazil to be really important and that each country makes its own sovereign decisions. They always say funny things like that, but the the fact is, is that they're outraged by anything, any sort of positive interaction with Iran, which, you know, the closest allies in Latin America are Venezuela, Nicaragua, and uh, Cuba obviously have very positive relations, but now we can add Brazil back to that. And Celso Amorim, in that same interview with the Global Times this weekend, said that, uh, you know, one of the most important reasons why it's important to end with dollar dominance in uh, in trade is because uh, because the example he gave was that when they were trying to uh, uh, trade uh, chicken, poultry, meat with Iran, uh, 
that they weren't able to, and it created large difficulties because of the illegal sanctions. And he said uh, illegal sanctions or unilateral sanctions. That's that's how he frames it. Because it makes it difficult for us to do just regular commerce with the, with the countries we work with. And so it's very it's very clear that they consider this to be an important ally. And so um it you know I, I don't really know how how long they can keep up the charade. Brasilia and Washington pretending to be friends, pretending to be close allies, all the stuff that Biden said, you know, during the trip, uh Lula's trip to Washington, they made it seem as if they have all the same values. They made it seem like they have the same problems. Obviously, they were comparing uh January 8th of this year in Brasilia, what took place with the storming of the three powers to the January 6th thing that happened in Washington. They're basically saying it's the same. They were saying that, you know, they both, the two countries have to confront fake news, that they have to confront extremism, these sorts of things. I think a lot of what was stated there was very superficial. And at the end of the day, they really don't have the same worldview and I hope it becomes more and more clear. And I hope that Lula and, you know, his, his, his you know, the people around him realize that they're just going to get totally slandered from here on, that they're going to come under um, the attack by the media, both, you know, foreign media and Brazilian media. And that it's going to be very difficult to stay on everyone's good side and that instead of like trying to please everyone they should you know take more of a leadership role as far as the region is concerned uh the way in which president maduro has taken a very important leadership role despite his country being much 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 smaller than brazil so i guess we'll have to see how 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 long that that charade can continue they are very important trade partners brazil and the us so they can't just ditch them Yeah, neither one. They just have two different, two antithetical views of how, like you said, of how that should be done. Two different, completely different views of, you know, how the world should be operating. You know, and Lula is definitely, you know, promoting and living in a multipolar world, not dominated by the United States. (laughs) And Washington is still in that hegemonic, unilateral U.S world, which, I, you know, I would argue just really, when you get out of North America, United States specifically, North America in general, and the U.S. as well, the multi-world is already here. And a good part of the global population is living in a multipolar world now, has been. And um, that's what they support. And yeah. so the other thing I wanted to say, because I just saw this hilarious uh, video package on France 24 in English, they, you know, they were they reported on Lavrov's visit to Brazil, and they showed these images of the people protesting Lavrov's visit, and it was literally like four people. I saw other images where it was like eleven people. So, you know, all the between all the ones that I saw on Twitter and the ones that I've seen um, in this news package, it's just very clear that it was extraordinarily small uh the protest against lavrov's visit you know by either uh ukrainian brazilians or whether they were just supporters of ukraine that were there um you know around the government buildings when he when when he came to make the visits and i think that's just indicative of the whole region i'm not totally sure perhaps if lavrov were to travel to uh chile he would receive you know, he'd be he'd be met with huge protests. I don't know, but certainly not in any of the countries he's going to. There is very strong pro-Russian sentiment uh, in Venezuela, in Cuba, and Nicaragua, like undoubtedly. Yeah, specifically yeah, uh, Nicaragua and Cuba, and that it's the same thing in Africa. You, we've seen labor unions in uh, around South Africa you know, they go out and they've protested and they've brought, uh, they protested, you know, just normal uh, things against the government or whatever it is. Uh, but they have brought out on occasion Russian flags, as have several countries of, of our region. And I think that's becoming more and more, um, you know, of, of a dominant uh, sentiment here. People are tired of being lied to by the media. They think that sanctions are a sham. They think that the United Nations system is being uh, 
is being used uh, in order to attack small countries of the global south. People yeah. have noticed that the ICC, the International Criminal Court, is used only to attack essentially uh, leaders of Africa that no no other, uh, you know, crime committing leaders of the global north have ever been tried at the ICC. So I think, you know, everyone is figuring out what's going on. Uh, the the understanding of the conflict here or in Latin America is quite different from from what it is in the global north. And I think even people in the global north are starting to have their doubts because they're seeing the cost of living rise. They're seeing inflation. And so I don't really know, you know, I, I think that it's going to be very difficult for the media and, of course, the the governments they work for to be able to continue selling us um, you know, this, this war and continue extracting from people. But in the case of Latin America, they haven't extracted anything. We haven't, uh, you know, our Latin American governments haven't sent any uh, funds. What kind of funds would they have to send to Ukraine? They haven't sent weapons. Uh, obviously, they're not sending personnel or anything else. So we just don't want to be involved. And that's not not that's not just a reflection of the the policies and the positions of the governments, but of the entire populations of all of these countries throughout Asia, throughout Africa and Latin America. No, it's really clear. And Brazil is a is a is a big voice in in that sentiment, but much of the global south too. We want those resources to build, you know, peace and uh, and, a, and an economy for our own people. We don't want that money and resources going to fuel more war in Ukraine, which could, you know, any minute spill over to, you know, a global conflict. It's really clear the the the, the money, the time, the resources are going, you know, to building our own people, our own economies, and 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 that's where peace comes from. You've got a stable economy. You've got people that are able to improve their lives. And these are, you know, throughout the hemisphere, there are, it's a spectrum of economies that people voted, you know, through candidates since I, October of 2020 through Brazil last fall. You know, one step left of center, social democratic types of economies to revolutionary left economies. But the focus is on raising, countries raising their own people. That's China. That's the example China has set for itself in the world. And, and Brazil's a really vocal government about that. The resources aren't going to go to Ukraine. The resources are going to go to our own people. Yeah, precisely. I I, I received a message from a, a reporter in in Russia, and, and he's saying that also in Russia... All the TV programs have been nonstop talking about Russia and Lula. Um, In a good way. (laughs) Never before have they have they discussed it at this um, on this like level or intensity nonstop coverage. And he says, you know, that people are discussing Lula's statements about, um, well, about consider uh, refusing to supply weapons. Um, and the abandon the abandonment of the dollar as important steps, um, and then also he said that you know they're having discussions about how the U.S. might now try to overthrow Lula because just based on these like couple yeah. of remarks that he made over the weekend in Beijing, so it's it's obvious that it's really shaking things up. Yeah, it's very exciting. I mean, it's not it's not going to be easy, and it and it could get pretty volatile, but. Uh, but what's what's unfolding under Brazil's leadership, Lula specifically, his articulation, it's very um, it, it gives gives me a little bit of hope that you know the globe's gonna be somewhat stable and not just blow up in our faces, which by some days and might when I'm super cynical, feel like that's that's what the u s would prefer versus embracing multilateralism is to just really end it all. It's so it's so tenuous, you know. Yeah, and the other thing I wanted to mention Washington. uh was that while in Caracas, he met uh Sergey Lavrov met with two other countries, which are he met with the Bolivian foreign minister who was on a trip to Caracas. Oh, that's nice. Rogelio Maita. And he met with the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, uh Ralph oh. Gonzalez 
who is uh, the SELAC pro tempore right. president. And so this well, that is was significant because I think when people heard about this tour, this Latin America diplomatic tour by Lavrov, that they just wondered why uh, Bolivia wasn't included on this, because, of course, Bolivia is not the most important economy, you know, in the global south, let's be honest. Uh, but it is a very I think it's a very important country in terms of, you know, a country that Russia could really grow its relationship with at this time. And so it was very good that that they were able to meet and then uh in the the meeting with uh the saint vincent yeah that's huge meet with salak yeah he he similarly rejected you know you know that old course of measures against russia and you know this is at a time when caricom has largely the different countries of the caribbean have have largely been condemning russia for, for its special military operation, but it seems like that's not uh, Ralph's position. And I suspect that, you know, I suspect that some of the other governments are going to start kind of backing down from, from their, if, if they were ever supportive of Ukraine, because they're just seeing the way in which this conflict does not benefit them one way or the other. And that, you know, they don't want to get sucked into it in, in any way. Hopefully they realize that, um, that, you know, the U.S. increasingly militarizing our region puts everyone in danger and is something that needs to be rejected across the board. Uh, but so those are two, you know, so that just means that so far on this trip, uh, Lavrov is meeting with at least six uh, six countries, yeah. uh, which again shows, you know, and these are six very important countries, uh, I would say very influential, including you know, Venezuela, which even though it's a country of 30 million people took, has taken such a huge uh, leadership role um, in the region at a time when it was, you know, heavily under attack and subject to uh, a large number of unilateral coercive measures, none of which have been lifted today. Uh, But despite that, they have been kind of leading the way, you know, against sanctions, against U.S. hegemony. Um, And so, so it's it's a huge that great boulevarding vision of what the Americas should be. We talked about this last week with Carlos Rowan about the Monroeism vision for the Americas coming from the from the north and the boulevarian vision for the Americas coming from from the south. And it's it's I mean it's really clear that that's playing out today. That 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 clash and the boulevarianism is really developing in throughout the south and moving moving up, moving north. It's really, it's very, it's very exciting to see that. I think it's fascinating, and I'm really glad you shared with us that um, that Venezuela facilitated Lavrov meeting with the Bolivian foreign minister and with um, Ralph Gonzalez from you know the president pro tem of Salah. That well, that's what Venezuela that's huge. has become. Venezuela has yeah, become a meeting ground for um, for for socialists, for anti imperialists. Um, you know, during the Bolsonaro years, Brazil is a very large country that should be facilitating all sorts of, you know, social movement um, encounters and and things like that. But in fact, they were forced to move other places. And so one of those places was Caracas, where uh, the, the the Sao Paulo Forum has, has met on many occasions, mm-hmm. um, as well as other social movement gatherings and things like that. So, you know, Venezuela is a country that like uh le- like Brazil under Lula's government is very friendly with you know other countries of the global south other emergent economies and has welcomed a number of world leaders to meet with president Nicolas Maduro in Caracas and um i mean he even met the the president of FIFA you know all sorts of celebrities have come to meet Venezuela mm-hmm. and you know just as well as anyone that it's actually not very easy to travel to Venezuela. It hasn't been in recent years. Um, If you're a citizen of a lot of countries, such as the U.S., you have to- Specifically the U.S., it's, yeah. It can be- Intentionally difficult for U.S. citizens to go. Yeah, and and I think there's other considerations that that someone might, you know, they they might look at the fact that they could be subject to secondary sanctions Mm -hmm. 
they fly their aircraft, if it's some sort of a business person or whatever it is. But despite that, we've seen, you know, the the kind of relaunching uh, or restoration of diplomatic relations with so many different countries and uh, and Venezuela now that even before even before the U.S. decided to cancel Guaido um, when he was still pretending to be uh, the interim president, uh, the, you know, all the, these these diplomatic relations were already being restored. And that was what the U.S. their whole claim was that uh, that a large part of the world, which was like, you know, 50 countries uh, didn't, Down to recognize, like 12. <laughs> didn't recognize uh, President Nicolas Maduro and his government, but they recognized this other guy. And, um, you know, that just all fell apart. And so the Lima group fell apart. And uh, now it's just, you know, it's it's really obvious that the whole thing was was a big, you know, pyramid scheme. But unfortunately, a lot of people fell for it at the time. Nevertheless, it's an extremely important step uh, for uh, Venezuela and Brazil to be restoring their relations on all levels. Mm -hmm. They say that, you know, they want to um, as quickly as possible restore all these different things. I think they've already exchanged um, their ambassadors. Yeah, I believe so. And recently, uh, maybe a month ago, uh, so, so Amorim, of course, Lula's advisor took, you know, sort of a secret trip to, I mean, not so secretive because they posted the the photos, but it wasn't like an agenda that was, that was publicized in advance to go meet with Maduro. And so that again is another indication as to what uh, Brazil's intentions are right now internationally. This is not just about, you know, I think during the campaign and in d- the debates, Lula made it seem as if it was very important for Brazil to be friends with its neighbors because of the issues of immigration and the climate mm-hmm. and the Amazon. It's very clear now that it's much deeper than that. Mm-hmm. that they actually have a shared vision for you know, regional integration. They don't want countries to be excluded. They have the same uh, you know, political aspirations, let's say. Um, and, and I think that this is a government in Brazil which on a whole has a lot of respect for the Bolivarian revolution and this current government in Venezuela. So I, I believe that that, that, um, you know, we're not going to see any slandering of the Venezuelan government. Obviously they're very much in favor of Cuba. They, Lula has demanded uh, the lifting of the blockade. And I would also suspect just based on the silence around Nicaragua for of mm. course I'm totally against the silence that was my next question <laughs> what about I'm totally Nicaragua? against yeah. you know backing down from from these issues um and leaving them up to everyone's each uh, for each to have their own interpretation but uh they haven't joined on this you know joined in this campaign of slandering Nicaragua no, uh, which you know ha- has uh included uh you know the president of Colombia of Chile um, you know, several people in the Argentine government. And uh, to some extent, you know, Mexico shares those same positions, but hasn't really, you know, uh, it's from what I can see, hasn't really uh, gotten too deep into it. But I think, you know, people, there's some people in Brazil from the left that that would probably share those same sort of Gabriel Boric positions. But uh, despite that, they uh, officially, the foreign uh the foreign affairs ministry has not actually put anything out that has um that has in any way condemned Nicaragua or called on Nicaragua to do anything um and and I read those every day right so yeah. um I think that so they're, they're just staying neutral to, they know it's a well or, the thing is is that you know these these statements are they're not meaningless, but there are just things that are more meaningful. And so one of those things is that Brazil's, uh, you know, Brazil itself um, and its banks can um, can offer financing to Nicaragua. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I guess just the way in which the, the social movement leader I mentioned earlier had said that Brazil should be providing um, some, you know, construction help with some of the projects that that Nicaragua is in need of right now. Um, I think we're going to find out sooner or later what sort of relations these countries are going 
uh, to have Brazil, Brazil and Nicaragua. And I suspect that they're going to treat Nicaragua just like any other country. They're not going to chastise them or uh, withhold, you know, that sort of support because of some claims that are being made in the media um, in the most slanderous campaign that I think we've seen on any country um, in our region. I think that they do want to have a uh, good relations. That's something I'm, you know, following really closely, trying to see what's going on. But I spoke to another, um, you know, social movement. Uh, the, the one I, the one I interviewed recently was uh, an urban housing movement, but I've also right. spoken to um, rural movements and their positions, uh, which are very large, by the way, in, in Brazil, because Brazil is a very large country. So we are talking about this represents a lot of, of organized people. And their position is that, um, you know, as far as Brazil is concerned, when there is a government that has a socialist orientation um, and, you know, it's elected in, in a popular vote, with popular support from the working class people, that if there are any issues um, that the people of that country need to solve yeah. it themselves. And it's, there's no right. um, there's no reason at all for the Brazilian government to get involved in such an issue, the way in which all these other countries of Europe and the US and Canada are trying to suck them into uh, to this whole campaign based on the pretext of uh, you know fake human rights violations um, and so-called political persecution. It is a very slippery slope if they were to join that, because if they're going to join that, they they might as well also join, you know, in the campaigns that are against the the mass government, because right. they're making the same claims about human rights violations and political persecution there. I think, I mean, if you look at if you look at the whole picture and the way in which Brazil has so far in these first 100 days interacted with Venezuela, with restoring all relations with Venezuela. Uh, with that meeting with Maduro, uh, the way in which they haven't joined the anti-Nicaragua campaign, the way in which they're uh, having, you know, good relations with Iran, China, and Russia. I mean, it, it, I think it's very difficult to make the argument that this government of Brazil is aligned with the U.S. and the Democratic Party. It's moving on. It's embracing. It's embracing what has been emerging for a couple of decades, but I mean, it's really, I would say like the almost, but I would also say Mexico has been a, a, a visionary voice for Latin America and the Caribbean as well. But really Lula is pretty much picking up that baton and saying, and of course has, you know, has the economic might, the, the population size and the, and the landmass size to really just take the hemisphere forward in engaging a multipolar world. I mean, not even forward. He's just like embraced it. It's like this is it's like this is this is the world today, and this is our role, and this is what's best for our people. And here we go. And peace being the most important thing for everyone on the planet, really in order to to develop domestically and internationally the, the, the peace his his voice on 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 peace is really so important it's so large and so important that it's it's like it gives me hope <laughs> i mean it really does yeah so so what else should we talk about camilla I've 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 had you engaged in conversation for almost an hour now. I hope you I hope I haven't kept you from 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 other projects. But is there anything that we've that we've not touched on regarding Brazil and Lula's vision well, and the, uh, Russia? The invitation that was extended to Lula via Sergey Lavrov was, I think, to attend the economic forum in St. Petersburg. So we'll have to see when the date is for that. So again, it looks like there could potentially be an actual date for the visit. Um, but I, I think that'll be really interesting. It'll be interesting to see whether um, in fact, Lula will accept Zelensky's, you know, invitation to visit Ukraine because uh, he does say, Lula does say that he wants to be 
a mediator Mm -hmm. and bring all these neutral actors together. So um, I think if he wants to prove that, and I think he does, he'll have to go take the visit. Sounds like it's a visit he's not dying to, to take, but um, he'll have to do so uh, to, to earn their trust. Uh, But yes, it sounds like he he's losing the trust of a lot of people over in Europe. Well, more reason for him to go to St. Petersburg. <laughs> Just keep building that multilateral, multipolar world. When yeah, so there there was this like can't deny Russia's there a huge player. Very, there was this very aggressive news anchor in Brazil who was interviewing Celso Amorim, uh, Lula's chief advisor, and he said, "Why?" on the way back from I'm speaking slowly because I, I like I say every I think everything in Portuguese and I'm just translating <laughs> that, why on the way back from Beijing did he um not go to so Lula went to the United Arab Emirates and yes. it was like a one one and a half day trip and signed like 15 agreements I'm sure it's a very important um trip it's just that i was covering so many things i wasn't able to see the details but the the guy was basically interrogating celso amorim saying why didn't he instead of doing this at because it was considered an add-on an extra trip it's not like he left brazil to go uh to dubai it was just you know something that he was able to to do in addition to this big china trip and he said why didn't he go from beijing to to ukraine he said, why, why wouldn't you just have like a stop off there? So this is kind of what they're dealing with right now. It's just being interrogated, um, you know, on their position saying that it's not neutral. I mean, that's the headline is that they're not neutral and that they're, you know, being courted by the U.S.'s uh, enemies. But, um, you know, I think for for the global south, it's still considered neutral. And I think it's, it's winning. Uh, this government a lot of support within the country from people who who want to see you know the global south taking a stand for itself and you know wanting to see an end to the conflict and um what what, what more can we do like we, we're, we're all a part of the conflict because we're all on earth and we're all going to be subject yeah. to the same uh you know the same nuclear holocaust or whatever um and lula's just trying to help find a solution no it's really it's it's just such a huge and important voice and it's very very you know like i've said a couple times it's for me personally it's very encouraging it's like oh my gosh there's somebody you know of a sizable influence with sizable global influence you know saying you know we need peace you know and and we're not gonna help escalate anything in ukraine i just it's it's a voice of reason and it's a voice of hope for all of us that there's some opportunity here. So, so we'll just keep watching Brazil and we'll have you come back and to keep us updated as things continue to unfold. I'd love to have you come back and keep us posted, especially if he, especially if Lula goes to St. Petersburg, that'll be a fascinating uh, event to cover. So. Yeah, it will be. And so I guess we'll have an eye out for the rest of this week to see what the turnout is in terms of uh, these important uh, meetings in Nicaragua and Cuba. Russia Mm -hmm. is such an important ally to Cuba and Cuba continues to be suffocated under a more than 60 year long blockade um, and, and sanctions, which are illegal and which have been condemned by the whole world over, with the exception of the U.S. and and Israel, and so every year at the at the U.N. General Assembly, and so with all of the you know issues with fuel shortages um, and needing to import things, I think uh, you know hopefully they can look for some solutions. A lot of uh, you know Cuba has been impacted by climate change um and of course covid and everything else and during covid the u.s went even further to impose additional mm-hmm. sanctions and also made it impossible uh and blocked really important uh, medical supplies and equipment 
um, from the island. And so hopefully, you know, Russia can really uh, step up um, there and, and, and find a way to, to provide additional support because, you know, this, this region might be in fairly strong solidarity. We saw, you know, we've seen some shipments, you know, to, to Cuba during crucial times. Um, for, for example, when there was that explosion at the, and fire at the refinery, Re Bolivia was one of the, the governments that sent donations to, to Cuba and we've seen this a couple times over, but um, at the end of the day, it's going to take a little bit more than that. So for that reason, it's very important to see what comes out of this, this trip, lab Rob trip to Cuba. Yeah, well, for the hemisphere, especially now when we're considering, you know, what Venezuela helped facilitate, what additional meetings. So like you said, I think it's six countries. I mean, Formerly four, Brazil, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, but now six and perhaps even even more. So yeah, it's a, it's a new world that's emerging, or I would argue has emerged. And you know, the United States is trying to put the genie back in the bottle, and I, I don't think it's possible uh, without a mushroom cloud going up. And so <laughs> it's let's hope that doesn't happen. So so thank you, Camilla. Always a pleasure to to work with you and and talk with you. I always learn so much, and I so value uh, your experience and your your observations from from the ground. So um, so I hope you come back and we can follow you know this this relationship with Brazil and Russia and continue to follow you know Lula's presidency and 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 its significance for the Americas and the rest of the world. Yeah, thanks for the chat, Terry. I think for for myself. Um, as a correspondent, as a reporter, as an editor, and at Kasachu News, it's very important that our coverage is rooted in the facts because it's so easy to get swept away by the headlines of all the mainstream media and to actually, you know, be online on social media watching, you know, the feed. You just see a lot of rumors. You see a lot of things based on um, prejudices, based on, you know, wrong information. You don't see links. You don't see anything that's concretely, uh, you know, tied back to uh, primary sources. And all of the reporting I do, if you look at what is on my feed um, and on the feed of Calcetra News, it's almost always just direct translations of the yeah, statements exactly. made by Lula and others. Uh, I simply just share what the Russian Foreign Ministry has said um, or, you know, other uh, state outlets we provide great English translation to and I take yeah, we take direct we took direct statements from the State Department of the U.S. from the White House um, and other U.S. officials as well with absolutely no desire to distort any of this information we think that people are you know have the ability to decide for themselves and see things for how they are but they need to be able to uh, have access to this primary information um, and, and base and, and base their uh, understandings of what's going on in the world on on these things. Um, I find it very difficult to cite things like Reuters articles or AP articles, or you know the BBC or CBC because simply you know they're filtering through information in a very different way. Um, they are editorializing things, and they're not always including um, you know the the location of where where they got this information from. When I hear that uh, a minister of Lula has made some statement or done something controversial, I have to go back myself and listen to it myself, translate it myself, uh, and not just regurgitate things without verifying them. And I think that's extremely important. Diplomats obviously have to do that. Governments have to do that because if not, we would be you know, starting wars every day. But I think as journalists, we have a little bit of a responsibility to our audience to do that as well. So that's something I try to provide. We're not providing in-depth analysis of things. We've not provided, um, you know, these big investigations uh, or anything like that. But we do provide, I think, the resources that we're able to find and, you know, basic translations so that people can actually see what the positions are of these governments. Exactly. Also what the positions are of, you know, social movements. It's unfiltered. It's a really it good. It is unfiltered. From, yeah. From the primary so, sources. And it's very good. And for the audience, um, in the program notes, I've included links for uh, Camilla, for her social media handles, and also for Casa News. So, so you can find both. 
in the, it's all in the program notes, how to find you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah. Okay, everyone, I just want to uh, remind you, you've been watching What the F is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, we're a popular resistance broadcast. We broadcast on YouTube Live every Thursday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. You can find us on the YouTube channels for the Convo Couch, Code Pink, Popular Resistance, Post Broadcasts. Recordings can be found on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your broadcast. So, uh, so thank you again, Camilla, and uh, we'll see and talk to all of you next week.